All right, so as Jenny said, I'm going to be talking about the history and future of race, health, and justice. And again, I'm very honored to be able to address you today on this topic. Uh, I will start just by pointing out one of the gross health inequities that was recently uncovered in the United States. And I know from looking into this for an article I published, a short article I published in Lancet, uh, that there are very similar health inequities related to COVID in the UK. Uh, although the groupings are a bit different in the UK, there's more of an emphasis I found on uh, Asians and people from the Caribbean. And it, that just makes a point about how these racial classifications are made up and change around the world. But basically in the UK, as well as in the United States, people of African ancestry had far higher rates of COVID infection and death than people of European ancestry or white people as we call them in the, in the US. And uh, there was immediately a uh, debate over what the cause was. Of course, we wanna know the cause so that we can address these inequities and end them. Uh, and in the United States, there immediately was a leap to looking for innate causes. And in other words, causes that are innate or inherent in black people as a race to explain it. And so some of the headlines and uh, uh, comments made in peer reviewed journals were hypotheses related to some unknown or unmeasured genetic or biological factor, the possibility that genetic or other biological factors would cause it, uh, people speculating about specific deficiencies or differences uh, based on race that were the cause. At the same time, uh, the other side of the debate were people pointing to structural racism and social determinants that were the cause. And one that I especially appreciated was an interview with Kamara Jones, who is a black female researcher in the United States who worked for the CDC, the Center for Disease Control uh, for a while and is at a uh, the University Center now. She also served as president of the American Health Association for a while. And she made the point, which I think is a mantra that we could all use, racism, not race, is a risk factor for dying of COVID-19. And she pointed to two main mechanisms that caused this racial difference. One was that people of color are more infected because we're more exposed and less protected. Uh, in the US, and I know this is the case in the UK as well, people of color are more likely to have so-called frontline jobs, not necessarily disproportionately as physicians, uh, but disproportionately as the people who clean up in hospitals tend to the uh, bodily functions of patients and are also less protected. They're less likely to have the kind of high quality gear that they need to protect themselves. Uh, also, they're more likely to travel to their jobs on public transportation because they don't own cars and are exposed that way as well. And the reason why they're disproportionately in these lower paying jobs that are more dangerous is because of structural racism, because of residential and educational segregation, uh, inferior resources, including educational resources in their communities, leading to limited employment opportunities and discrimination in their search for employment. And then the second mechanism was that once infected, people of color are more likely to die because we carry a greater burden of chronic diseases. And again, you know, getting COVID, if you're already with impaired health, you're more likely to die from it. 
And the reason for these higher rates of poorer health uh, is also structural racism uh, because of the higher rate of chronic diseases caused by living in disinvested communities where the what's needed for good health is less available. So poor food options, poisoned air, less access to healthcare and other impairments of health that are structured to target these segregated communities because of racism. There was another reason suggested by a ProPublica investigation into the ejection of COVID patients from hospitals in New Orleans. And the investigation found that black patients were being sent home or to hospice care to die uh, without getting uh, the same kind of treatment that white patients were getting uh, as their relatives were begging for the doctors to continue treating their relatives. Now, this was not uh, uh, an empirical study. This was based on interviews with patients, but it's backed up by what I'll talk about a little bit later, the undertreatment of Black patients uh, for various conditions. And uh, I, I am not surprised that you would find hospitals discharging Black patients without giving them the kind of care that they give to other patients. Another side point I'll make about this study is that it shows that relatives were asking, begging for high quality, highly technical care. And this belies the stereotype that is often circulated in the US that black people are afraid of doctors and that they don't wanna get care and uh, that they do not understand uh, the importance of personalized medicine and other kinds of um, more sophisticated types of medical care. In fact, there is a long history of black people pleading for care. Uh, studies that show that black people are more likely to contest doctors when they want to discharge patients or discontinue life-saving care. Uh, and so the idea that black people as a race somehow have a culture that is uh, afraid or averse to medical care is simply belied by the facts. That's a, that's a stereotype. So where does this idea that black people have innate predispositions to die from multiple kinds of diseases, including COVID and, and all the other diseases that Black people have a higher rate of getting and dying from. And uh, I think to understand this whole topic of the persistence of health inequities and the failure of biomedical science and, and the health health professions and medicine to address them adequately and sometimes not address them at all. In fact, sometimes point to paths like the innate biological difference that actually deter us from addressing health inequities. We really have to go all the way back to the very invention of race and uh, the false concept that race is a biological category that naturally divides human beings. One way we know that that was invented and, and that's not true about the human race is that we can look to the very origins of the idea that the human species is naturally divided into races and look at how scientists were absolutely instrumental in inventing this concept. Uh, and ironically, it was invented during the Enlightenment era, which was supposed to be a break from speculation and superstition and theological 
ideas to understand human beings and, and the whole universe. Uh, in, in fact, what happened was that European scientists imported from pre-modern folklore and uh, theological concepts, the idea of a natural creation of races. And so uh, at the time of the beginning of the slave trade, the beginning of European explorers, so-called discovering the new world and wanting to dispossess indigenous people of their lands, it, it, even at the cost of exterminating entire populations of people uh, and enslaving African people. The Christian church uh, invented this idea that God created the races and that's why Christians could enslave other human beings. The Enlightenment scientists who came right after that period in the late 1600s, early 1700s, uh, just adopted that idea because it was useful to support slavery and, and conquest. And they adopted this folklore that some natural force divided all human beings into races. You can read the writings of Johann Blumenbach, for example, where he almost word for word takes up this backward idea, this false idea, this invented idea that a natural power created the races. And instead of saying God did it, they just replaced various terms for nature uh, invent creating the races. Actually not, they didn't acknowledge inventing it. They were creationists, which is also ironic that uh, modern day scientists like to poo poo the idea of creationists when in fact, when it comes to race, they are creationists. Uh, they are using the idea that nature created races as if it were a scientific discovery or a scientific fact. So just to give one example of uh, a US colonist who of course, before he uh, helped to found the United States was an Englishman. And uh, while he was still an Englishman, he wrote a book about nature and he uh, wrote in it that the reason why black people could not be emancipated and he continued this idea for why black people could not be part of the democracy he was founding based on liberty and equality and tolerance and freedom was not because he was a racist and a white supremacist and an enslaver, which he was, but because of the real distinctions nature made. So this idea that nature created the races with distinctions that explain the social differences between them, the political differences between them has been extremely useful since the 1600s and it continues to be extremely useful in the 21st century. Now, uh, doctors were very important in promoting this idea of biological races uh, because they created the, uh, the racial concept of disease, which seemed to support the notion that races are natural biological divisions of the human species. And the racial concept of disease is that people of different races have different diseases and experience common diseases differently. Uh, that was an idea developed during the slavery era. And it is probably, uh, I would say, one of the foundational ideas of modern medicine today. It's an idea that is taught in virtually every medical school in the United States today. But it was a concept, again, invented in order to support enslaving, conquering, and dispossessing non-white people. And one of the chief promoters of this idea was Dr. Samuel Cartwright, who in 1851 published a report for the Louisiana Medical Society on his investigation of the peculiar diseases of the Negro race. And uh, lo and behold, just like the Enlightenment scientists before him, he found that 
the biological differences between black people and white people all supported slavery. So his main concept was that black people had lower lung capacity than white people and therefore had to be forced to work by white people in order to be healthy. In other words, he claimed that enslaving black people was not only good for their health, but necessary in order for them to be healthy. He also invented, although he said he observed this, uh, the disease of drapetomania, a mental disorder that caused black people to flee plantations. Uh, again, uh, a, an idea about a peculiar disease that only black people have that explains why uh, it was good to enslave them for their health and why their escaping enslavement was bad for their health. In fact, was a mental disorder. Now, this idea that black people as a race have different bodily functions or their bodies operate differently in a way that requires different treatment for them uh, has been embedded since the time of slavery and uh, Dr. Cartwright's time, embedded in medical technology. So it's so deeply rooted in medicine that mo many, many algorithms in the US, and I found some examples in the UK where this occurs as well, assume that Black people's bodies, you know, as a race, categorically, automatically, uh, are operate different, and therefore these algorithms or diagnostic tools have to so-called correct for the difference in Black people's bodies. Uh, one example is the spirometer, which Cartwright himself helped to uh, perfect. It's actually a device that was invented in England to uh, measure differences in lung capacities uh, to show the harmful effects of coal mining in England. And when it came to the United States, it was used by Cartwright and others to show that Black people innately had lower lung capacity, which again, in Cartwright's view, justified forcing them to work for white people. Now, uh, the spirometer uh, in some versions still in existence in the United States today has a button to push to insert the patient's race so that it can correct for black people's presumed lower lung capacity. And that means that a measurement that is considered unhealthy for a white person would be considered healthy for a black person because black people supposedly uh, all have this lower lung capacity that is innate to the race. You can imagine how harmful this is because it means that a black person who, if they were identified as white, would have gotten care for a, a, long, a, a respiratory illness and instead doesn't because it's considered healthy for a black person. This has been used in lawsuits in the United States for mesothelioma, the uh, asbestos poisoning against companies that manufactured asbestos where black workers have gotten lower damages than white workers with the exact same injuries because a medical expert testified that black people have lower lung capacity to begin with and therefore the harms to their lungs uh, are you, you must show more harm to the lungs of a black person in order to get damages. Another example that is routinely used in the United States, although a number of hospitals very recently have stopped using it, uh, it's probably up, maybe up to 10 at this point, but you know, out of a huge number of hospitals in the United States, uh, and that this is the estimate for glomerular filtration rate, which is a very important indicator of kidney function. It's what doctors use to determine whether or not a patient's kidneys are functioning properly, whether they need to be referred for uh, specialized kidney care and uh, evaluation. And you'll see 
uh, in this example of a lab test, which is common, that the estimate, if it is a African-American patient is adjusted upward. So any other patient of any other race, any other human being gets one number and then it is adjusted upward to a healthier number for African-American patients. Uh, this means that black patients are less likely to be referred for specialized care. Uh, and it disqualifies some black patients for getting on a kidney transplant waiting list, whereas they would have qualified had they been identified as anything other than African-American. Of course, this raises all sorts of questions. What does it mean to be African-American? Would some uh, a black person from the UK be adjusted upward or not because they're not African-American? Uh, how much African-Americanness or Africanness do you need to qualify for this? Uh, and those are just the simple questions that should end this practice, but there are also the questions of how can you justify a practice that we can see is harming patients? And also how can you justify a practice based on a false concept of biological race? Yet it continues. Um, uh, another example of race norming that has been in the news in the United States lately uh, is a lawsuit by black former National Football League players, uh, you know, football is not soccer in the United States. It's a different game altogether, a much more brutal game that does cause brain damage to many, many players. And the players sued the NFL for damages because of the harms from concussions. And it was discovered when uh, some players were denied damages that the NFL was using a different test altogether for the black players that assumed that their cognitive capacity was lower than the white players. And therefore they had to prove more harm to their brains in order to get any damages at all or to get damages equal to the white players. Uh, this is very similar to the race correction practice that I just mentioned. And just uh, last week, because of the exposure of this form of racial discrimination, the NFL agreed to stop using a different test for Black players. Now, when the US public heard about this, there was a great outcry about how could you discriminate against Black people so blatantly, but they don't realize that this form of discrimination is routine in medical practice in the United States. Again, it's embedded in algorithms and diagnostic tools. It happens all the time, every day. And yet uh, doctors will defend it as being a way to be more personalized uh, for black people. Uh, than if they used the same test for Black people as they used for all other human beings. The uh, biological concept of race during uh, slavery uh, permitted medical experimentation, encouraged medical experimentation. Of course, during the slavery era, Black people had no right to consent or not to consent. So. Uh, experiments could be conducted on them routinely without any effort to make it them voluntary. There was no concept of an enslaved person consenting or the need for them to consent. And so uh, there were many, many experiments conducted on enslaved people like the ones depicted here, uh, J. Marion Sims performing gynecological experiments on enslaved women without their consent again, but also without anesthesia. And in the US uh, later, uh, during the 20, 20th century into the 1970s, the United States government funded uh, the syphilis study that 
tested syphilis in about 600 black sharecroppers in the South without giving them available medical treatment, uh, allowing them to die from the disease and then autopsying their bodies to see whether or not the disease affected black bodies differently from other people's bodies. I know uh, the UK, in the UK, there were tests of various uh, chemicals uh, during World War II to determine uh, the effects of chemical agents on people of Asian descent versus European descent. Uh, I think I have that history right. I'm not as familiar with it, but um, I, I just want to make it clear that this is a global uh, a phenomenon, not just something that occurs in the U.S., although I will agree that the U.S. is the most egregious when it comes to these kinds of uh, medical experiments that it conducts around the world based on concepts of biological race, looking for dif racial differences uh, among human beings, although it also has a tendency to conduct experiments on Black people in order to use the results for other people. So uh, it, it, there, there's a lot of contradiction in the way in which biomedical experiments are conducted on people of color, both based on an assumption that their bodies are different, but also based on the assumption that experiments on them can be useful for uh, beneficial medical care for white people. So another example of how racial concepts of disease and biological concepts of race are continuing to harm Black people in the United States is the undertreatment of Black patients for pain. It has been known for at least two decades that Black patients are less likely to get any pain treatment or adequate pain treatment for very painful injuries. Uh, for example, studies that show that Black patients are less likely to receive pain medication for long bone fractures. Uh, there's recently been attention in the United States, although this has been going on for a long time, that pay Black patients with, with sickle cell disease are routinely denied uh, pain treatment because of stereotypes that they are just seeking drugs uh, because they are addicted to drugs and go through extremely painful bouts of this disease uh, without being adequately treat treated for their pain. Uh, a really disturbing study that showed that black children with appendicitis in severe pain were less likely to get opioid analgesia than white children. Uh, again, I believe that this is based on a stereotype that black people are prone to drug addiction and therefore uh, they shouldn't be given opioid pain treatment. Just as an aside, you may know that there is an opioid epidemic in the United States, which began in white communities and some researchers have traced this to the racialized prescription of painkillers uh, with opioids being marketed as painkillers for white people based on the idea that this was a, a legal drug uh, that was not, didn't have the kinds of negative uh, stereotypes and vilification around it that was associated with black people's use of drugs and that physicians were much more likely to prescribe it to white people leading many would say to this opioid crisis which now has spread into other communities. Uh, and it's interesting to think about the uh, approach to it, a much more sympathetic, empathetic approach to this crisis in white communities than drug use in black communities, which has always been addressed with extreme punitive uh, carceral approaches. 
Whereas with opioids, the policymakers and, and politicians in the US have argued that it's the fault of the drug companies and they have been sued with one drug company going bankrupt. So the responsibility here has been placed on the drug companies rather than on the addicting addiction behaviors of white patients, which is good, but a very different policy approach to black people, which is, uh, has affected and been influenced by the ideas of doctors, uh, doctors' prescription habits based on these underlying stereotypes uh, should also be held responsible for the opioid crisis in the United States. Uh, this study was very helpful because it linked the undertreatment of black patients for pain to false concepts about biological differences between blacks and whites. This was a study at the University of Virginia Medical School, one of the leading medical schools in the United States uh, that investigated the ideas and the prescription uh, recommendations of white medical students and residents. Residents are actually treating patients in the US and found that a substantial number had false beliefs about biological differences between blacks and whites, including ideas, stereotypes, like black people have thicker skin than white people and black people have less sensitive nerve endings than white people. And the researchers found that those false beliefs predicted their racial bias in pain perception and treatment recommendations. Now, when the human genome was mapped, there was a, a, a welcomed sigh of relief that finally genetic researchers and biomedical researchers would stop treating race as if it were a biological category and innate trait and begin to think about the human race as being very united genetically, but also that the genetic differences between people were not grouped by race. But in fact, what happened was the opposite. Uh, the New York Times, probably the leading paper in the United States, one of the leading papers in the world, began to publish especially by the journalist Nicholas Wade, articles proclaiming that the next phase of the Human Genome Project would be to look for genetic differences between human races. And uh, I wrote my book, Fatal Invention, How Science, Politics, and Big Business Recreate Race in the 21st Century, after confirming that indeed there was a spike in peer-reviewed articles treating race as if it were a biological category and uh, uh, a spike in newspaper reporting about how the new information about human genetics could lead to discovering biological differences between races that could explain all sorts of health and other kinds of racial inequities. And so I argued that we were seeing a new biopolitics of race where scientists were defining race as a genetic grouping, providing genetic explanations for racial inequities in what many people were saying was a, a world that a society that no longer was structured by racism. And biotech and pharmaceutical companies were producing race specific biological remedies for these supposedly innate genetic problems that uh, caused health inequities. So uh, race began to be, and this is still very common, reinvented now, not as a invention, a, a creation by God or creation by nature, you know, sort of in a vague terms, but specifically population clusters based on genetic differences due to evolutionary pressure. So evolution became the natural force taking the place of God, taking the place of just 
some force of nature, but more specifically now theories about how evolution uh, produced races. And uh, there were studies that showed the spike in the use of race as a biological category in uh, articles, scientific articles on race and genomics. This idea also continued in biomedical research. Let me just flip to this. So with hypotheses like this, looking for explanations for health inequities, and one which I kind of skipped over is the high rate of maternal deaths in the United States generally, the US has an increasing, a rising maternal death rate. Uh, here again, we are an outlier compared to European nations. Um, but uh, black women in particular are far more likely to die from pregnancy related causes. And I'm sure uh, Jenny Douglas can confirm that that's the case in the UK as well. Uh, and hypotheses like this, looking for genetic explanations for these kinds of health inequities. So this one I think is especially egregious testing the hypothesis that black race independent of other factors increases the risk of extreme preterm birth. Uh, what is black race? Again, how much African ancestry do you need to qualify for being in the black race? I mean, I'm asking that kind of facetiously because of course it is a invented social category. Uh, but if you're going to study it as if it were a biological category, you need to define what you're talking about. And these researchers didn't do that. Most researchers don't because they can't. Uh, and how can you control for every other social factor than this supposed biological race that would increase the risk of extreme preterm birth? And then finally, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to control for, instead of investigating the social factors that increase the risk of extreme preterm birth? Also, uh, there was the rise of various kinds of uh, medications that took race into account, including the Food and Drug Administration approving a specifically race uh, targeted medication. So a medication labeled explicitly for black people. This was, is a therapy for heart failure that was uh, found to be very effective in a clinical trial, including only black uh, research participants and was approved for black people on the theory completely unsupported that uh, the FDA could use self-identified race as a surrogate for genetic markers. Although this drug dilates the blood vessels, it was developed by a cardiologist, has nothing to do with genes. He, had, he knew nothing about genes. And yet this false idea that we could use race as a surrogate for genetic markers was used by the federal agency that approves pharmaceuticals in the United States to justify approving this race specific drug. And the FDA in its news release said this was a step toward the promise of personalized medicine. Well, to me and many other people, it was a step away from it. Uh, to me, if you prescribe a drug to me based on my race, you are not personalizing it. You're doing the opposite of personalizing it. And so to this, I think this comment has so much false concept within it uh, to unravel, uh, believing that a race-based drug somehow is makes it more personalized and could possibly lead to personalized medicine. Uh, if anything, it blocks the development of truly personalized medicine by continuing to rely on this false concept of biological race. And so many times I've seen uh, in these race corrections, for example, how continuing to use race as the basis for determining uh, diagnoses and treatments, it is stopping 
biomedical researchers from looking for something that would be better than race. Uh, and now that race is being ended as a correction in some hospitals, finally you have researchers that are looking for something to replace it that's better, that should have been researched for a long time. Okay, let me uh, move on so we have time for discussion to uh, a, another uh, uh, approach, which I alluded to at the beginning when I discussed COVID and the reasons for higher rates of black infection and death. And that is research looking at how structural racism affects health. And I'll just mention a couple uh, studies that are kind of innovative and interesting, but there are a number of studies that are being developed uh, and becoming more and more innovative and empirically useful in looking at how to even study how structural racism affects health, something that has been overlooked for too long. So uh, one study looked at how Black people living in states with high levels of structural racism, which they developed a tool to measure, were more likely to report a heart attack in the past year than those living with low structural racism. Uh, there have been studies looking at how police violence, which of course has been uh, the focus of, of protests and uprisings around the world, uh, affects the, light, the health of both people living in communities where there are high rates of use of force by police, but also Black Americans' health generally. And so in Fatal Invention, I summarize this by referring to how racism gets embodied. Uh, race isn't a biological category that naturally produces health disparities because of genetic differences. It's a political category that has staggering biological consequences because of the impact of social inequality on people's health. So let me just quickly go over some recommendations that I made with a uh, physician, sociologist, uh, researcher, professor in the US named Jonathan Metzl, who's helped to coin along with Helena Hansen the term structural competency to replace cultural competency uh, as a way of training physicians and biomedical researchers to understand how social structures, including structural racism, affect patient's health. And we recommended that uh, as is happening with this conference, we confront and not hide from racism, medicine, and I would add biomedical research to be anti-racist. It needs to be interdisciplinary. Uh, we are too siloed and in the health professions and biomedical research, there are lots of people who have never studied race or racism and they need to learn from the social sciences and the humanities to understand what they are studying. Uh, STEM courses, you know, the ones that focus on math and science generally do not include these topics and in fact may be teaching false concepts. Uh, we need to be creative and innovative and collaborative in addressing structural problems inside and outside the clinic and coming up with innovative research designs and also speaking up about the structural issues that impact patients and public health. Uh, people involved in the health professions have a strong voice. They are respected uh, a lot more than people in the social sciences and humanities, I think, at least in the US. And uh, people believe that they what they have to say is based on fact and empirical investigation. As I pointed out with people like Dr. Cartwright, that can be harmful when they're saying things that are false about race, but it can be helpful if they use their voices to speak out against racism and in favor of anti-racist policies. So I'll just close with the point that the best way for us to have a healthier society is to have a more equal and just society. And that is ultimately what we should be working for in order to end the health inequities that persist and to have a truly uh, healthy, equal 
just anti-racist society. So thank you so much. I look forward to our discussion and again, appreciate the opportunity to engage with you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dorothy. That was just so um, insightful and also challenging. Thank you. Um, which it, it's important, as you said, that, that you know, we start to challenge some of these notions. So I have a few questions for you. So um, one of the first questions is the enduring impact of scientific racism on medical treatment. You know, for example, the differential application of pain medicine is disturbing. What interventions would be most impactful in countering such bias? And are medical students and clinicians aware of these biases? Yes. Yeah, so the question actually touches on what I think is one of the best ways to challenge it, and that is in medical education. Uh, as that study at University of Virginia Medical School indicated, medical students harbor these false ideas. And then when they come to medical school, those ideas are reinforced. They're not challenged in most medical schools. You know, they, they come to medical school having heard these stereotypes about black patients and other patients of color. And then they get to medical school and at least in the US, every single course emphasizes the innate biological differences between races. You know, they're taught, when you become a doctor, the first thing you do is notice the patient's race, not note that down, and then diagnose the patient according to race and prescribe medication or other therapies according to race and treat the patient according to race because it's not just diagnosis and, um, and, and, and prescriptions, it's also assumed that the black patients aren't compliant. And so you have to patronize them more, you know, all of that. And that's a, one of the problems with cultural competency is that often cultural competency that says to doctors, well, in order to be less biased, you must learn about the cultures of people who aren't white and what you learn about them is stereotypes about them. So it just makes it worse. And so we really need a revolution in medical training. And as I suggested at the end of my talk, it can't just start in medical school. It also has to start in pre-medical school courses. I know in the US, medical students are encouraged, not, don't take sociology and history you know, and all those fluff you know, courses take math and biology you know, and chemistry. That's what students are encouraged to do. And of course, those courses don't teach them anything about racism generally and don't disabuse them of the stereotypes they came to college with. And so it's really important. You know, we could go down to kindergarten, but at least in college, you know, in secondary education, they should be learning about structural racism and how it works and, and taking courses that disabuse them of these stereotypes and these ideas about biological race. And then medical school curriculum has to be changed. And let me say that I mentioned that there has been a dramatic outpouring of opposition to race correction, especially in the EGFR, the one for kidney function. And uh, some hospitals have ended it and they've ended it because of organizing among students. You know, at, at many medical schools in the United States, it's the students who have been demanding change in the curriculum and change in medical practice. So it's a two-way street. You know, we have to uh, educate our students better, but we also have to listen to our students who are saying this must change. And I'm a big supporter of uh, medical students being supported when they criticize. And this is a bold move because they are taking the risk 
of antagonizing their professors and the, you know, the doctors that who are supervising them. And I really uh, shout out to all those medical students who are organizing for change. So that's just one way I could go on, but I, we probably don't have time other ways to do it. But the, the idea that, well, let me just mention one other thing, which is the idea that is uh, being embraced and understood better around the world of abolition, that you need to abolish the, these backward ways of thinking, these unjust ways of thinking and the, and the structures that support and, and are influenced by them. And uh, this, uh, the, this bold idea that we just, we need to end this. We need to end race correction, right? <laughs> Is important as well. And we need to, organize among ourselves in conferences like this, when we go back to our home institutions, as to strategize about how to do it. And so that's another um, recommendation I'd make. Okay, great. Um, we have a few more questions. Sure. Is, there, is there a concern that personalized medicine will intentionally or non-intentionally exacerbate structural racism? just as genetics expedited the rise of eugenics? Yeah, I think any so-called advance in medicine, we have to be very vigilant about. The history is so important. That's why I always <laughs> include history when I talk about this and probably spent all, most of my talk today <laughs> on history, because it's important to understand that these ideas were invented by scientists to support racism. And they continue to be reinvented over and over again by biomedical researchers, genetic scientists, and others in newfangled ways. And so we can never believe that just because we're talking about you know, liberal, even progressive scientists, that they don't embrace these ideas. Some embrace them subconsciously, some of them embrace them very consciously and believe, just like Cartwright believed that, you know, this was good for Black people. They will always say this, you know, if you, you read some of the worst articles promoting these false concepts, there's always something in it that says, well, I'm, I'm saying this because it's good for Black people's health. So that, that's where you really have to be vigilant. And so we, we need to look at how these ideas, especially this idea, the, the biological concept of race, the racial concept of disease gets reinserted, re-embedded you know, in newfangled terms, novel terms in each so-called advance in medicine. And that's in addition to the question of who will have access, but you know, access to something that's harmful is not good. So access is important to take it, you know, to understand. But I think we also can't just rely on, well, who will have access to this? It's also these more fundamental ideas. And as I pointed out with the FDA's rollout of Bidil, which was based on false concepts of race and tying it to genetic difference without any support whatsoever that the idea that race is necessary for personalized medicine, I would not be surprised if personalized medicine ends up being developed and rolled out and implemented according to these false racial categories. And, and also uh, another thing we have to be careful for it, of is how it can be used as a substitute for dealing with the structural forces, which are the main impediment to equal, just, uh, excellent healthcare for everybody. Uh, you cannot address the deep structural inequities like residential segregation with neighborhoods that are targeted you know, for police violence where there aren't healthy food sources, where they're being inundated with unhealthy environmental conditions. You know, you cannot fix that with personalized medicine. 
And it's a, it's a mistake to think that personalized medicine is going to solve it. And so we have to be careful of that as well. And that's not to say that we shouldn't uh, work toward better medicine, you know, medical treatments and therapies for people and make sure that everyone has access to the best therapies. But we also have to be careful about these other ways in which racism and biological concepts of race and inequities, structural inequities have consistently been embedded, imported into these. Do I have time to say just one more thing about that? Yeah, 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 no, carry okay, on. Just one, one quick, one more quick thing about it, which is to be careful also of this practice I found where biomedical researchers say, oh, I recognize this history of racism that you know, has gone on up to today. <laughs> you know? But now <laughs> we understand and we are uh, enlightened and we don't have to worry about it anymore. We're not like those other racist you know, researchers. That happens all the time as well. And it becomes a barrier to being critical about what is happening today and in the future. And so that's something else that we really have to be careful about. That's great. Um, another question, do the American health insurance companies take these adjusted, you know, race-based <laughs> me measures for spirometry and GFR into account when setting premiums for black people? Yeah, so I'm not as familiar with exactly what's going on today in insurance. I know that there is a history of uh, insurance companies. In fact, insurance companies in the at the turn of the 20th century were some of the chief promoters of these kinds of corrections. Um, w, I, I skipped over a slide by W about W. E. B. Du Bois and his work at the turn of the 20th century, Philadelphia Negro, he published in 1899. And he was challenging at the time, these racial statistics that were being developed by insurance companies in order to uh, charge higher premiums for black patients, deny them, um, I, I should say black uh, customers, you know, deny them uh, insurance. And uh, so there's a long history of insurance companies being critically involved in this. Um, I don't, I don't want to say for sure because I just haven't studied it recently, but I, let's just say I wouldn't be surprised. These race corrections and race norming, they're used in so many ways that most people are completely unaware of. And uh, that's why the, you know people shocked by the NFL using them. And uh, they're thinking, oh, we've gotten rid of them. No, they're everywhere. So uh, I'm sorry, I can't give a more definitive answer, but I would not be surprised at all. And I know there's a long history of it. Great. So um, do you think that the rise of nationalist and populist politics in the UK and the US has made learning the lessons from identified inequities harder. Yes, yeah, so uh, it's funny, I was gonna include a slide about that and I took it out because I figured I'd be going on too long. But uh, so it is really interesting and disturbing and enraging to think about the relationship between the rise of white nationalists politics or you know, re-rise of it, uh, but the growing popularity of it in the United States, in the UK, and you know, around Europe as well, all over the place. Um, and uh, definitely uh, there are, I, I, I don't know about the numbers, but certainly they're rising in uh, in their visibility. I would imagine that helps to recruit more young people to their cause. And they rely heavily and promote this idea of biological, you know, racial biological difference, uh, emphasizing that white people are genetically superior. 
And let me let me say something which I think is important about that, which is, and this relates to my last comment about saying, well, we're not like them, so we can continue using these ideas. So it's very common. Number one, for these white supremacist organizations, they all have websites or most, you know, the big ones have websites and they are using these peer reviewed scientific articles being published in uh, journals in the United States and pro probably in the UK as well uh, that claim to find genetic differences between the races. They post them on their websites and they say, oh, look, this is proof what we've been saying all along by these esteemed, even you know, the liberal scientists are conceding this now as if they have a great victory in science. And then what happens is the liberal scientists say they're misusing our work. In fact, in uh, a couple of years ago, the American Society of Human Genetics had to confront this at their annual meeting. It made probably international news that they had to confront that many of their members had their research published in these white supremacist websites. And they issued a statement uh, during the meeting that said, we uh, do not agree that white people are superior. They can't use our research to say that. But they never said, we will stop this research. You know, we will stop saying what they were being cited for. They are being cited for claiming that race is a biological category and that racial distinctions in genes produce these unequal outcomes. So they're using this technique where they refuse to give up on this false idea about race continue to do research using it, but just say, oh, but we're not like the white nationalists. We're not like the white supremacists, so we can do it. it so, so it becomes not only the white supremacists, you know, now getting more support because they can cite this research and they've got websites and people recruiting people all over the place, but the people they're citing refuse to stop doing it. Right? They, they don't understand. And let, let me make this point as well. They think, these scientists, that race is a biological category that gets misused by racists, you know, who want to say white people are superior. But it really is a biological category. And as long as you're not a racist, you can continue to promote that idea and just disclaim what the racists do with it. Okay. But that's not right. That's fault. That's a, a misguided view. The truth is that race was invented by racists. It was invented to support racism. It is not a biological category. It is a political category that's invented. And so you cannot say that, well, I'm going to, I'm okay using it as a biological category as long as I don't use it for political reasons. No, <laughs> it is a political category. You cannot use race without using it for political reasons. So in my opinion, people say, well, should we just stop using race? No, we can't stop using it because it exists. It is, it's how our world is organized, right? We can't mm -hmm. stop using it. But we have to use it, instead of using it for the political purpose of injustice, we need to use it for the political purpose of anti-racism and racial justice. So if you're going to use the category as a political category, which it is, to try to understand how racism affects health, right, and then implement anti-racist policies to end it, that's a good way of using the category, right? And you're using, you know, I say this idea that we're neutral scientists. We can't, you know, we, we can't make a, a claim about race, but we can use it as a biological category in our research okay. is just a, it's a naive way and harmful way of thinking about it. As I tried to show in my lecture, mm -hmm. race has been used for political ends from the beginning of its invention. And it's been used that way by scientists. 
Mm-hmm. You know, we have to acknowledge that politics shapes biomedical research and biomedical research shapes politics. We need to confront it. That's why I have no problem saying research should be anti-racist because either it's going to be racist or it's going to yeah. be anti-racist. Like you cannot just say I'll be colorblind and not and yeah. use it without paying attention to that. That's how it's going to be used. And getting back to the question, I think the use of these pro- these uh, uh, studies by white supremacists and, and, and nationalists shows that you can't escape the politics. Uh, you, you have to be aware of it. And uh, as, as I said at the end, think about how can we design our research so that it moves us toward a more equal society. And that's the ultimate way that we will have a healthier society for everybody. Great, thank you. And this is the last question and it kind of um, kind of asks you to expand on that a little. In the move okay. to abolish the use of race in biomedical calculators, formulas, is there any role for keeping race in some calculate calculations? For example, outcome calculators that are used in patient counseling. It seems dishonest for me not to admit to a black pregnant woman that her outcomes are statistically likely to be worse because of racism, but removing race from things like birth outcomes calculators leads to exactly this situation. Well, I think that, uh, let me just say overall, as I was saying, the question is, are you using race as a biological category, which it isn't, or as a social category? It sounded from the question that the, that the questioner was asking about a way of using it to demonstrate how racism affects people. And I, I'm not, so I'm not familiar with the particular calculator. Um, I, I don't want to say, I, I don't want to say yes, you know, I, I think that's a good one or it's not a good one. I would rather speak more generally that if the calculator is using race as a measure of racism, then uh, I think there's a, a possibility it could be useful. Um, the ones that I showed uh, the, in the spirometer and EGFR, they are using race as a biological category um, that is a false way of thinking about it. Um, uh, let me also say that usually when race is used in medicine and biomedicine, it's not measuring, it's not to measure racism. It's to measure um, something else. <laughs> you know, it, it might be socioeconomic status. It might be um, a particular health condition that uh, maybe is more prevalent statistically in one group rather than another, but isn't categorically only in that group. Um, but it's actually measuring, you know, whatever that factor is. And so even in the calculator that the question was asking about, it may be that there is something else, uh, not race itself, that is producing these outcomes. And so uh, it, it, I, I think we just have to be more innovative and creative and careful about exactly what we are using race for. I'll give an example, just rec- just in the last few days, the group that gives, makes standards for the calculator that determines whether or not someone can have a vaginal birth after a C-section took race out of it. It used to uh, be a calculator that included race so that black women were more likely to be told you need to have a C-section. You cannot have a vaginal birth. Now that is harmful in general because C-sections are more dangerous 
And so it was steering women towards black women towards C-sections. Now, maybe I'm sure this calculator was based on some study at some point that showed that the black women in the study, I shouldn't say I'm sure, probably, because sometimes you don't, sometimes they're just based purely on myth, but probably some study that showed that black women had higher rates of problems when they had a vaginal birth after a C-section. But that doesn't mean that every black woman is going to have problems. And there's something else, there was something else, right? Not her race or their race, something else that determined it. What was that something else? Yes, that something else might have been more prevalent in the black women because of racism, but that's, but it's not their race that caused it, it's the racism. So even in the calculator, the question is asking about, I'm not sure that just because the patient is black, you should tell the patient, well, you have a higher risk of X, Y, and Z, because they may not have a higher risk of X, Y, and Z, because maybe the reason why the black women in the study that produced that outcome had it is because they lived in an impoverished, segregated black neighborhood. But if you are black and grew up in a wealthy neighborhood that wasn't segregated, that you're not going to have that outcome. Or, you know, or maybe it has to do with some factor that you could pinpoint to give that patient a better um, analysis, diagnosis, prediction of what will happen to them. Because the, the problem is, as with the VBAC, the vaginal birth after C-section calculator, you are harming black women by assuming that they're going to have this bad outcome if they have a vaginal birth, when in fact, that's not necessarily the case. The other thing is that I was saying about how relying on race is sometimes blocks us from addressing the structural problems. It may also be that if we stop doing that, we would pay more attention to what is it that harms black women, you know, if they have a, a VBAC. Can we address that? Yeah. Right? Instead of just saying, you can't get one, right? You know, can we address that? Can maybe it will lead to figuring out ways to make it safer to have a vaginal birth. Maybe we'll stop relying so much on C-section. You know, like there's just so much that can be better if we don't automatically turn to race. And again, I, I, you know, I'd love to have a deeper discussion with the person who asked the question. I think it, it, it opens up, uh, you know, the need for a working group you know, to work on this question of, is this a case where we should use it, but taking all of these into account, instead of just assuming, well, we know that these outcomes are worse for black women. So let's just tell all black women that they're gonna have this outcome, right? <laughs> instead of uh, digging deeper into it in a way that might actually be better for black women in the end and everybody in the end. This is the thing, like it, it leads to, a better way of addressing health for everybody as well. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dorothy, for an amazing and fantastic keynote lecture. And thank you so much for answering all the questions in such a kind of thoughtful <laughs> way. It's thank fantastic. You. Great so, questions, by the way. Great questions. Thank you for them. And thanks, Jenny, so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed this engagement with you and the others.